Welcome to the video, everybody. I'm really happy I'm here with my millennial son, Brandon. And of course, you know, I'm a baby boomer. The purpose of this video today, the topic of this video today is I'm going to, in my observations, identify a few things that the younger generation maybe gets wrong, does wrong, doesn't understand when it comes to investing. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to say from a younger guy's perspective, what my generation, the older generation, doesn't understand or gets wrong. And you know, the hope that here is that some of the tips, some of our discussion will, will prompt our viewers to uh, you know, assess their own situation, see if, if they're falling into any of these traps that we might call them. What are your thoughts on that, Brennan? Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely gonna be an interesting discussion. Mm. And I'm just thinking in my mind right now, I wonder if you had the young, younger generation and the older generation, who makes more mistakes? I think probably the younger ones, and that's fair. They have less life experience and they're just new and they're reckless. But as we'll look at today, I mean, the, the, the older generation has their own suite of mistakes and biases totally. that they fall into as well. So yeah, yeah. I'm just, I wonder which one, I guess by the end of this uh, you know, discussion, we'll, yeah. we'll have a better idea. And uh, it'd be interesting if you leave a comment, who makes more mistakes, older or younger, and, and see, and maybe if you're leaving one, sit, Put your age. I'm older, and I think the younger ones do, or you know, I agree. So that would be a good, a good uh, topic there as well. But let me just sort of kick things off here. So, okay. as a baby boomer, when I look at the younger crowd, the millennials, and the way they invest, one it's not really something that they, they do wrong, but something that um, affects the way they invest is it's impossible for the younger investor to have a perspective of time. And when you're looking at something like investing, it takes a long time typically. If you're investing sort of in a normal way to build up wealth, and it can take decades of investing. Unless you are proactive and study, I mean, yeah. there's, there's ways that a 27 year old can learn about history, but most people don't take the time to do that. You certainly can't learn it from experience. You just have to take the word of others that you are trusting. Like you have to believe that the wisdom out there, it's one thing to believe it, because everybody hears you want to be you know, in the markets and you need time, but it doesn't really resonate with people, uh, with some people. Some people, it clicks and some people it doesn't click. Right. But yeah, we certainly don't have the time to, the experience, the life experience and time to, to look back and take, well. <laughs> Do the math. If you're 25 years old, yeah. you don't have three decades of investing experience or even a decade in most cases. Yeah. Right? The danger of, of that lack of perspective, like you say, you can learn, but the reality is most people, most people won't. And... It kind of, it ties into patience. And I'm lucky, I'm 60 years old, I've been an investor for decades and decades, and I can look at my, my statements and say, gee, I bought company XYZ literally 30 years ago and see what it's done. And I, there's concrete evidence. It's not just reading a history book or looking at some chart. It's, hey, this is my own account. So I can benefit from that and say, this isn't a mistake really that younger people make, but it's, some, it's an area that they really have to be aware of and I would say, kind of commit to it. Almost say, okay, I really believe that. Because I think you, you have to believe it. I think that's the thing. I, mm. I think what what a lot of younger people struggle with is, you know, because we don't have as much money. Like as a six year old, you have money, you have dollars, you have assets. Mm. Uh, when you're like just finishing university or even in school, like in your twenties, you, you may not have a, a income coming in. A lot of people will just think it's. I'll start investing when I make money. Yeah. I'll push it yeah. off. They yeah. don't have the urgency to get started immediately. Yeah. Uh, because the, the logic is, well, hey, my dollar figures are so small that it's probably meaningless. Uh. And when I get my first job, when I start making money, then I will invest. Mm -hmm. And that does push it back uh, a number of years, sometimes into kind of your mid twenties, really. And, Realistically. Yeah. And again, if you, if that, if that works for you, like that, that's, it's good if you can, when you get the money, you start investing, but I think a lot of people then just don't do it because they haven't formed those habits. Well, a lot of it is, you just said the word habit. And yeah. I, you know, I guess I was kind of lucky. My, my father, well, like yours, was, was in the financial industry. Hmm. And I believe when I was 18, he started, you know, put I guess, probably 25 bucks a month or something, but start putting money away every single month. And it's not the 25 bucks that's gonna create wealth for you, it's the habit, it's the discipline of doing that. And, and even as a, when, by the time you're 25, you'll see some results and it'll cement that in your mind. So um, we'll move on to sort of your points there, but I think that's sort of the, the, the point there is, uh, yeah, time perspective is a very challenging thing for a younger investor, so just be aware of that. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I think what I think older people get wrong, not all old people, but I think for one, the most obvious one is is some of them are too far on the conservative side mm -hmm. and uh, they're afraid to take risk when, again, we're not saying you should be extremely risky, 
but but they're afraid to take any risk. And that's that that that's fascinating to me because if you've lived to age sixty, you've lived through um, ups and downs, ups and downs of life, uh, yeah. and, and probably being laid off at some points, and seeing you know the financial crisis yeah. and seeing the tech boom and bust. You've been through that, and to me, logically, you would have seen how the markets recover and how yes there are sometimes you know tougher years mm. but over the span of a 30 year period i mean it to me it's obvious how how things work uh with time again maybe they've gone through the maybe they've been affected by these periods differently where even at age you know let's say you're retire approaching retirement years at your age 55 50 you know 60 yeah you know, you'll see people that would be like all GIC, like no stock. They don't yeah. want to be in, in the stock market when, when there are conservative stocks out there, there are conservative <laughs> yeah. funds to buy, yeah. but they just want to be, I'm going to do a GIC or I'm just going to, you know, be all government bonds, whatever it is. Um, I think they get that wrong. Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of anecdotal stories, I suppose, but um, in my career as an investment advisor, I'm a potential client comes to mind. And I say potential because I worked with a family, like the, the, the children, <laughs> And dad had passed away, but mom was in her 80s, I guess, and had a lot of money, apparently, sitting around in term deposits and GICs and just in her bank account. And for a long time, the children tried to convince mom to put some of that money into the markets. Yeah. Right? And I don't know if they were thinking, well, gee, eventually this will be our money, so let's grow it as much as we can. <laughs> but the, the family grew up, they were a conservative mom and dad, and they were just, in their mind was, investing is risky. Yeah. So they just wouldn't do it. And especially after dad passed away, yeah. mom was like, I'm not going to do it. Almost tried. I mean, we had appointments booked. She'd almost come in and bail at the last minute, right? So I get that because um, that's just what, you know, and if you're old enough, I mean, we think of the big recession back in the 30s. And there's not a lot of people watching who were around then. Yeah. But certainly in the 40s or 50s, if, if you're a senior, you'll you'll have you know, could possibly have been, have been alive there. And those memories burn deep they when do. you hear the stories of, yeah. of even your parents. Um, so that's, that is, um, that's a challenge. I also, another thing I think of as well is, I mean, I worked with clients who were basically senior and the, the, the risk then is if you've got a really good lifestyle, you're set for retirement, why would you put that at risk? That's a mindset as well. And I would never advocate going, okay, well, gee, you're 75 and you've got a life comfortable lifestyle. Let's put a whole bunch of money into you know, the latest technologies. But statistically, even if you have, let's say 10 or 15 or 20% of your investments in good blue chip companies, the portfolio is actually less volatile yeah. than having it all in government bonds, right? Yeah. I ironically. So um, I hear you. I, I agree generally that the older generation mindset is too conservative. So yeah. do you think that's due to the case of like, like you said, sometimes if you've lived through some of these big depressions, yeah. did they get burned? Like they've actually like, oh, I, you yeah. know, you, you hear, Oh, I lost such and such amount oh, yeah. in, in, uh, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. And that's, that stays true to them where they can't yeah. find, find their way back into the markets. Or is it more just a, a generational thing where older people tend to, like, I know, for example, culturally, you'll find other cultures yeah. that come to Canada. Yeah. We speak with them all the time, yeah. whether it's, you know, South America, Asia, yeah. where it's like investing in the stock market is just less common. You just, you, you just buy don't do it. Real you, estate. That's, you, that's you buy real estate that, in, yeah. in Asia, um, yeah. in, you know, let's say South, uh, South America. I think there's a lot of volatility in those uh, financial markets yeah. where it's, I just save my money and I work hard and they're mm -hmm. very hardworking, mm -hmm. but investing is just not as common. For the older generation that have lived and grown up here, is there something like that that's happening or is it just these big events that have scarred them? Um, I, I would say a combination of both. Mm. I mean, the, I, I think the younger generation today is far more open to taking risks and to you know going with the flow. I was raised to just be more conservative. I mean, in more life traditional in general, mindset. It's traditional more, mindset. Yeah. So it can help you or it can hurt you. And But to your point, Brandon, I think when you, you know, once bitten, twice shy. So if you, I'm going to marry two things up. If you got hurt, say in the tech crash, where yeah. everything was great and we're all going to retire 10 years earlier than we'd planned, and then you got burned, then that will stick with you. But if you understand, like you just said, if you understand how the equity markets work, you can get to a comfort level, hopefully, of getting back in. But a lot of people just can't get there. And I worked with people who just couldn't get over that hump 
to go, yeah, I'm going to get back into the markets because, or, you know, gee, every time I think it's time to get back in, the markets crash again. Yeah. Well, that's probably bad portfolio management timing, what have you, but uh, yeah. So huh. uh, in general, Brandon, I would agree with you um, that, like I say, my generation is probably, um, probably en masse too conservative. Not everybody. Yeah, not everybody. You know, we have we have senior students in our academy who are very, yeah, they are risk takers. Almost too risky. Yeah. Right? And I, I did work with clients who were too risky, in my opinion, as well. And my job was really to kind of temper things and keep them in line. But uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm going to talk another thing where I think uh, the younger people get it wrong. And you touched on this in the earlier segment here, but I, I just sort of calling it procrastination in general. And a lot of people get started too late. And okay. as I kind of said, I mean, just start with a small amount that you can afford, but I know there is... I can't afford it or, you know, I spent all my money or I will do it. Like you say, when I'm, you know, at, at some point in the future. So do you see that with your peers or what are your, yeah, definitely. In yeah. fact, I, I thought that was kind of the point we were talking about up front on uh, the first one that you had, but I guess that was more or less the time you were talking about the lack of, um, time. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah. They're a little bit different because the first segment was on perspective of time. Yeah. You can't be expected to know what 40 years feels like, Yeah, but uh, a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old can invest. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of nothing to do with perspective almost. If you just go start putting some money away or a percentage of your, of your paycheck or whatever. Yeah. No, I definitely uh, agree with you that uh, a lot of people do just push it off. And I, I don't think, um, you know, there's, there's a point to in, f in favor of the younger people. Right. Which I think is worth, uh, you know, calling out, especially if you live somewhere here like Vancouver or, or Toronto or, or in a more urban city. Yeah, urban, yeah. It's, it's hard, like, it's hard these days, especially with the inflation numbers today. Yeah. To just even get by uh, renting, whatever it is, like, just living life. Uh, if you're struggling to make ends meet mm -hmm. with your job and, uh, you know, getting groceries and whatnot, you, it's hard to prioritize Investing again in theory, it's not. I put a hundred dollars, pay myself first, for sure. But in reality, yeah, yeah. it's it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. So I don't like I don't fault someone for saying, well, hey, you know, I mm -hmm. I'm not making that much money. I'm young. I don't have my career like ready or right in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to get there. Or maybe even I have these ambitious goals of like I want to be a homeowner. If you want to be a homeowner here in Vancouver, you have to prioritize that. Yeah. And you have to then, you know, save for your down money. You could invest that money, but I would probably say, yeah, you could put it in your TFSA and try and grow it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's just, there's not as many extra dollars floating around at the end of the day to, to then invest. So I, th that would be my one pushback for younger people well, nowadays. I, I would agree, but we're living right today in yeah. kind of unusual times, you yeah. know, with the high inflation. It's, it's not something that you've in your whole life up until this past year has experienced, right? No. Uh, and so... To, and there may be an occasion today where I, it's just impossible to do it. But I don't think that's on the, when you stretch that line out, I don't think it's a matter of that. Now, uh, something I heard many, many years ago, there was an article I read and the, the scenario was this. The advisor says to the client, you should invest a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. And the person says, I just can't. Like I'm spending every dollar I have, I can't. How much money do you make? Oh, I make $40,000 a year. Imagine tomorrow that you go into work and the boss says, times are tough. We're lowering your salary to 39900 dollars a, uh, a year mm. hundred dollars less 38 or sorry on a month on a monthly i'll i think the math would, oh yeah let's say 1200 over the course of a year yeah, yeah, yeah. are you saying that you're going to do what go get a different job mm -hmm. uh, i mean like you will survive if you have a hundred dollar less pay coming in every month mm -hmm. so why can't you then take the hundred dollars and put it into a tfsa or something uh, again very broad brush and i feel in times like today for people who just are stretched and maybe you're raising a family and it's really tough. Um, but just, I don't think it affects everybody. And there are people who can afford it and just choose not to, or maybe don't appreciate the time. There's, there's something that I know you've talked about in previous videos as well. I'm gonna talk this sort of you only live once theory. And there is, in my opinion, there is a much a mindset amongst the younger people today. I don't even know if I'm gonna to live to 60. That's really, really old. So I'm gonna enjoy my life today. I'm gonna to go on yeah. vacations. I'm gonna buy things I wanna buy. And I think that's kind of cool in a way, but what if you do make it to 60 and the odds are you will, mm -hmm. right? Then you're gonna have nothing or maybe live on CPP or old age security at that point. That's not a good scenario as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that 
that also plays into this, I will, I will, but first I gotta go to Mexico. Or I will, I will, but first I like that shiny new car. I think there's an element of that as well. There certainly is, and that's, I, I, I'm torn on that. Uh, again, I think we could go down a deep discussion here, but we probably won't for this video. But I do actually see more eye to eye with that argument of living and enjoying life. Right, yeah. As you're growing up. Mm -hmm. Than just essentially slaving away in the rat race for 45 years. Right. At age 65, 67, then enjoying your golden years. Allow me, yeah. as your father, to interrupt for just a second. Because I never said slaving away in the rat race. Well, I okay. mean, that's yeah. kind of like, it's what you kind of implied. Because no, I implied saying... balance. And of the extra 300 of discretionary income, you put 50 or 100 away. I'm not saying slaving away. Uh, and well, doing then, nothing, because I do believe in, in life balance for sure. Well, yeah, I, I guess you could also, that could go this way too and say mm -hmm. you do enjoy, yeah. I, I think that, I, I know what you're saying because there are a lot of people who just don't put any regard to saving in their future. Yeah. And they go on all these trips all day, all day long and yeah. go out to the bars. That's one camp of people. On the other hand, you do have people that just slave away till retirement. Absolutely. But there is a lot of middle ground. And I don't advocate for that, for slaving away. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, to be clear, I don't advocate for somebody who, who neglects all their savings to go on trips. But I do think that there is a, I think more so what, what the younger and up and coming generation is like realizing is it's, there, there is a balance. Um, you need to provide for your future, but you also can enjoy that. You can also enjoy the day to day think along back. the way. Think back to when you were a child. Yeah. And what scheme did we have in place for your money? You got birthday money. You got odd jobs here and there. Yeah. What did we do? Well, I had my long-term savings yeah. deal where I had to... <laughs> a deal. Have, well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Scarred you. It was a but, good deal. No. But the deal was, if you wanted to buy something, you could, but you also had to put money into long-term savings or investments as part of that transaction. The goal there, you're not slaving. You're yeah. not being reckless. You're doing both. Right? Yeah. And I think... Um, I mean, I, I think in most cases that is uh, doable. I also, it I takes do, me yeah. back sadly to when I got into the industry. I remember doing some of the initial studies. Yeah. And there's a big part, if you're going to be a financial advisor, to learning how to, uh, I would say, strong arm your clients into giving you every last penny that they have to invest because you make more money, et cetera. It, 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 that scarred me because I just couldn't believe what I was reading in the industry material. Wow. I would say to my clients, buy your new shoes if that's what, if you need a new pair of shoes like don't starve because i'm saying to you think about your future i hated that but there is that element of 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 my former community out there um, that does um that does you know think that way so hmm. so yeah good good good, good sort of feedback there brandon um and, and i agree with you like i just to be clear i do i i think there are good points and i i agree i was just trying to more or less play devil's advocate because mm -hmm. I think it's it's not as it's not as black and white, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think one thing that the younger my generation has is a little bit more perspective than possibly the the, the baby boomers. I think it's just you you have that um, fact fact. No, I want to hear that fact because I don't understand what you just said. Well, that let's say the fact they don't understand like it, it's clear like you know again then we could go down to the long discussion here but yeah. it's beside the point i i think the younger uh let's say millennials whether it be because of social media whether it be because of the things we're exposed to we we see so many different things mm -hmm. that maybe a, a, someone in a more traditional mindset would have not seen okay and, see. th and that comes with difference in beliefs mm -hmm. and i give the example of like you know what i do for a living right now i film videos we <laughs> do like everything internet based does on uh, that's not something that a, a six-year-old could ever a 70 year old, 80 year old could even think about. That's just not a possibility back then. No, it wasn't, it wasn't even a thing. No, it's just yeah, very, yeah. very one dimensional. Yeah. Like you go to school, you get your job, you work, you work in the mines, whatever it is. And you get your gold watch. You get your gold watch, you get your, Porsche, yeah, 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 you get your Porsche yeah. when you're retired. Like it's very, yeah. there's a very transactional one, like one dimensional is. Absolutely. As a millennial, like half my friends make money doing these weird side gigs and, and internet gig. Like right. we're just, our minds are open to a whole different way I of see what making you're money, uh, life, living life. And with that is like, you could argue, as they say, passive income. I know that's a cheesy thing to say, but it's, you know, imagine you have a, a side gig or an internet job that gets you side income, yeah. passive income, and you can then use that to go travel and you can do this. Those are things that just weren't, those opportunities weren't around as much for older people. And again, it's just the difference in generation. There weren't Uber drivers. There weren't Uber drivers. Or there weren't all the dishes. Or, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, totally it, it's different, but I do agree with you that 
if taken too far to the one spectrum of just enjoying life, yeah. you procrastinate, you, 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 you screw yourself over down the road. So I agree with that. Comes down to balance. It comes down to balance. Yeah. Um, and that kind of leads into my point actually where I think older people get it wrong. Huh. Is that they don't understand uh, necessarily all the opportunities, and I'm not saying that they sh- <laughs> that all opportunities out there are good <laughs> opportunities. In fact, it's quite the contrary. Uh, I'd I'd say most novel opportunities and ideas you see are like probably ones to stay away from. Right. But at least not being open to. Uh, not being not being Getting open outside to- of our little box so that we live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and again, yeah. it's not a bad thing. Like it's not a bad thing if you, you know. Oh, I, I understand the the banks, banks and insurance companies have been around as long as long as they can. Mining companies, energy companies. Like to me, it's funny when I see an older person mm-hmm. and commenting or chatting with me. I almost guarantee they're like interested in like gold, like just gold bars. And <laughs> don't ask me why. Gold, silver, <laughs> um, energy. Some are either pro energy or not, but it's. It, and, and rightly so, they aren't exposed to all of the different tech opportunities. They aren't exposed mm. to all of the innovation that we are, that's part of our, our lives. And again, I'm not trying to say that, you know, just because Uber is a un- unique technology, that's a great investment. Far from it. Because in many cases, it's, it's not. Right. These innovative areas are, are, are money But losers. you're saying being open to exploring. Being open to exploring. I, I, I'll, I'll just yeah. chime in there, Brandon. I do agree with that. And I'll just speak personally. When... I'm, you know, surveying the landscape of where I should have my money, mm-hmm. right? It, my world is much smaller than yours is because I don't expose myself to like the Reddit streams and the, the various online sites that, that share this information. Like you say, a lot of it's garbage, but there are some good things that come out of that as well, right? Um, my, if I hear of this great new amazing opportunity, my initial reaction is skepticism. It's just like, okay, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And and there's a lot of weight to put on that. But it doesn't mean that I shouldn't look at any of the opportunities that come out there. So I told, if that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. I totally agree. And I, I, again, where's that balance between me going, I don't want to have any, and a young guy going, I'm going to try everything that I read, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually a good thing to kind of approach with skepticism. Um, In Mm -hmm. fact, that's what I do as well, which Mm -hmm. I think is maybe not the case with younger people. Younger people, like you said, it's every new idea is the most exciting idea, whether it's cannabis, whether it's uh, psychedelic stocks, whether it's, uh, you know, gene therapeutics, like anything that's innovative is just automatically exciting. I think it's actually, that's again, maybe comes from the life experience of someone who's older where they've seen too many of these things come and go where they, where they're, that's a good thing. But I think if they're not open to at least exploring, you know, new ideas, I think, you know, you can look at Warren Buffett as an example of this. Mm -hmm. And this is just an obvious example, but I know he was very, uh, now he owns Apple and now he owns a variety of tech companies, but he was kind of a little more set in his ways that I'm not really going to join this tech uh, movement until later on. He was very much in that mindset. I don't understand it, so I'm not going to go there. Like I've got these opportunities come across my desk, don't understand it, goes in the garbage, goes in the garbage. Yeah. Left a lot of money on the table because of that. In hindsight, easy to say, but but that mindset is what I'm saying where uh, the Mm. older people... There may be, and it may not even be like a, for example, innovative um, sector. You know, there are new products coming to the market now, like these covered call ETFs and these solutions that may be really great for certain people. But if it's just not what they're used to, if it's not a GIC or a term deposit, I'm not going to, you know, bother with it. I thought you were talking about Coca-Cola Classic, which you don't remember when Coke changed to, or sorry, Coke changed to New Coke. Okay. And it was a gong show and people revolted. And now it's Coca-Cola Classic. Okay. And there's a debate whether it was a total screw up or whether it was a brilliant marketing strategy to get people to say, bring back the Coke. Mm. And so now it says Coca-Cola Classic. It never used to say Coca-Cola Classic. It was just Coke. And then New Coke, um, just, oh, look it up. Cause it I'll was, look it up. Yeah, I know. I just know Coca-Cola. Just <laughs> people, that. they got out of their comfort zone and... Yeah. People, yeah. I just think Coca-Cola has a bunch of cocaine in it from back in the day. <laughs> I don't think it does anymore. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty heard, sure. I've heard, I've heard, I've still heard things. If you trace, maybe. trace amounts. Trace, well, maybe. I think the FDA might have something to say about that. Yeah. But again, there's my skepticism coming in and you're more open to that possibility. Yeah. So we'll, well, we'll get off of Coke. But uh, yeah, I, I think, sort of summarize what you're saying, Brandon, totally agree with you that in my generation, we are definitely less informed mm-hmm. with the opportunities that are out there. It's a double-edged sword because it maybe keeps us away from some of the real damaging things that can occur. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, yeah, you might leave some opportunities on the table to at least explore. And I have found from working with you mm-hmm. 
that you're exposing me or you're, uh, my mind is becoming more and more open to looking at those things at least and probably cross them off the list, but at, at least looking at them. So for sure, so that's a good thing. And maybe there'll be some older people like me watching the video who go, yeah, maybe I will look at those. Still not gonna go into Reddit streams, but it, you sure. can just Google stuff. Um, okay, now I have one final thing I wanna talk about here, Brand, that talks about, in my opinion, a mistake that a lot of younger investors use. And I'm just going to call it the failure to diversify. And we've seen it a lot. And we've heard it on the, 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 our communication with people. Um, we've hopefully learned some lessons over the last year and a half or so. But there are so many people who get into investing, pick a hot stock, for example, and they don't put like 2% of their money into it or 5%. They go 60, 70, 80% of their money sometimes 100 percent or sometimes 100 percent into yeah. a stock yeah e either a sector so maybe it's all xyz sector i'm not going to pick on any right now but the the younger generation really tends to take big huge bets it can be great mm -hmm. but more often than not even if they win in the beginning of course, they know better and they're reluctant to sell so they end up losing a bunch of money on it yeah. and then learn so i i really I worry about that strategy. What are your thoughts on that from a younger pers younger investor's perspective? Well, I personally lean your way on this. Uh, certainly, like uh, I think it's I think it's reckless. But mm. you're right that a lot of young people do this. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean even if we just think recently to the GameStop um, right event, yeah, a, a lot of people like for a lot of people that was their first exposure to the stock market where you, like you know yeah it was crazy. And there were so many people opening up brokerage accounts for the first time yeah. and like. Literally taking whatever it was, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, something. But people, all of their portfolio, all yeah, of it true. into GameStop or AMC, and mm -hmm. some made out like bandits, bandits, <laughs> uh, and did really well. And I think, you know, that again, this has been happening far before, far beyond, like before that. But yeah. but I just think of all the new investors who were exposed to that, and and that's what their that's what investing was to them. Uh, another right. example is Tesla, obviously. Yeah. Where there's a lot of people that are all in on Tesla and. and Tesla obviously has gone through some really great runs and that just reinforces like that they're doing, they think they're doing something right when the markets right. are going up. Like, it looks like they're, it looks like they're doing yeah. it right. right. And why would you diversify? Why would you not mm -hmm. be all in on, on Tesla or GameStop when it's doing well? But like you said, I mean, hopefully people are learning now that it isn't, it isn't the best strategy long-term um, unless you, it's the perfect timing, which is, you know, few and far between. You're, you're right. Most people either ride it all the way down or what I've seen is worse is they actually cash out, they make a profit and then they, they think they can replicate that yeah, strategy. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen like YouTubers do this where, oh, I did really well on Tesla cash and they're out. looking for the next one next and just wave. getting the next uh, company that's starting from small yeah. and, and is yeah. junk at the, at the point and they never turn the corner, obviously, because I think Tesla was a pretty um, special case really at yeah. the end of the day. Very unusual. And, and and then they end up losing the money that they would have gained. But, but you could have made so much money. That's what that's what kills me. And again, that's coming back from years of experience because back in the tech boom, mm -hmm. you know, I've told on this channel before my story with Ballard Power, and I'm I I was up a lot of money, mm -hmm. and I wrote it back down, and I mean that is seared in my brain, right? This concept of taking some profits because ah, just don't get greedy. I guess is what it all comes down to. So that's that's kind of what I've observed, and I think. It's really easy. You talk about access to information. There's there is so much information out there that tells mm -hmm. you how to do things properly, mm -hmm. but there's equal amount or maybe more that tells you how to you know how to do things that aren't proper. You, and people get lured by these success stories. I know? will say this mm -hmm. too. We don't want to paint like the whole younger generation mm -hmm. like this because not, there's yeah. actually a lot of people that do it right. And I'm just I'm literally thinking uh, you know to my mind as I scroll through Blossom, which is yeah. the you yeah. know the app where you can see everyone's portfolios. Most of them actually have built a good, you know, well yeah. diversified yeah. or ETFs. They actually are extremely diversified in a very good way. And these are like, you know, capable people who have done the research. Yeah. They've built their portfolios. Then you have the other people who are just so, so wrong and so, so like, uh, yeah, risky and, and undiversified. It, but we, we tend to think of the younger people all like that. There's, there's still... I know you're not saying this, well, but there's still a lot of people who actually go seek out the right information and do it properly. But yeah. there certainly are people that don't. And the, the people who are on Blossom, you mm -hmm. said recently that there's 13,000 mm -hmm. members on there now. You know, there's millions and millions and millions out there who aren't That's dedicated true. to learning. That's right? true. And, and you know, but even on the Blossom app, you'll see some come on, I'm, I'm new to Blossom, here's my portfolio. 
And I would say maybe not properly constructed, but that's where they get the feedback. And yeah. like, well, you thought about this, or you got five ETFs in the Canadian bank space, like maybe trim those down. So and I guess that's interested a, in learning for starters. It's right? a skewed, yeah, it's basically skewed data because yeah. the fact that they're on Blossom. The troll group. Is, yeah, that's a bad, uh, that, that, I take back what I said. There's probably so many people out there who, who are investing in, improperly, yeah. all in on certain stocks, so, not diversified, or all even all tech, like you said, for that matter, which is very common. I only own the FANG stocks, or I only own yeah, this. Yeah, another good example. Uh, that you yeah. just don't ever hear about and see about, and that's a wide, wide range of people. I'm that's sure. probably more. To your point, Brandon, is, you're correct. If you have that that desire to do things properly and to actually spend the time learning, mm -hmm. you can. <laughs> there's there's a you know facilities yeah. out there to do that. So. Um, yeah. I'll finish off here with yeah, my sure. final point, uh, just talking point here that we can yeah. discuss. In, and I think one thing that um, older people get wrong is... And I'm going to represent older people here. Yeah, you are. So I'm speaking particularly to old people, like maybe 60 to 65 plus. Okay. Right? Not like 40, 40s. You know, I don't even consider 40 old anymore. That's, right. like, <laughs> yeah, that's just normal. Okay. Um, but 60 <laughs> plus is old. Yeah. And especially once they get into retirement... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them can go overboard with how their involvement, like they almost go a little bit, um, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I know, I know where you're going with this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's funny. Like people like when I've said this before, but when we look at, let's say students for our academy or speak to all these different people, it's like you have the young demographic who's like in high school, uh, you know, finishing high school in college, they have a lot of time to do their research and like yeah, learn themselves. Then you get like the middle years of people who are just busy. I yeah. have two kids on this. Work and family. Fam yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. And then as soon as it gets to retirement, these people <laughs> in retirement have like all the time on their hands, like too much time on their hands. And they get obsessed with checking the markets, reading the research. Uh, like they go down these rabbit holes that I think are not beneficial uh, to the, yeah. their portfolios and to them. Uh, if they enjoy it, like, hey, then do what you want. You deserve it. Do what you want in your retirement. But I definitely think there's a tipping point where yeah. people in retirement absorb, t they they get too involved in the investing space for their own good. I will respond to that on behalf of the old people, but I will say you are 100% correct. Not for everybody. Yeah. And I, I recognize I have a sort of a distinctive advantage here because I worked with people who went from those busy, busy, busy years into the retirement years. Mm -hmm. And for some clients, it was a stark and quick change where some clients would say, okay, twice a year, check in with me, look after the investments, but I kind of want to be kept up to date, but you do that for me. Mm -hmm. Then literally, you know, they retire, they take their month long vacation. They've always dreamt of, then they're coming back. What am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden things that you would never, ever have heard. And I would call it the minutia, uh, I have nothing against people really understanding and digging deep and researching, but you can take that overboard and it actually becomes counterproductive because sometimes you don't do things like this sort of paralysis by analysis where you should be maybe making a move, but if you're gonna go through and spend a week researching X, Y, and Z, you may never do something that you should be doing. Um, or all of a sudden you're going on and you're reading all these articles about company X and oh my God, they have a lawsuit. Someone's suing them for you know $200 million and should we sell that company? In the big scheme of things, it's such a, a small, normal part of what they do, mm -hmm. but it can really, yeah, it can, it can just go too far. So very I'll, good point. I would I'll agree also with you on that. tack on to that. Mm, One thing that I more. do, there's more. <laughs> yeah, there's way more. Jeez. But uh, no, the, what I also think is, is fair to say is mm. especially the... Uh, the sources that they get this information from is very important as well. Okay. And and for some reason, it's like, well, I mean, it makes sense, but a lot of these retirement uh, people, like, th they subscribe to, let's say, a newsletter, right? As a, just, as, as, just as an example. Sorry, my yeah. phone's going here, off here. Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, newsletter. Yeah. And that's kind of like their source. Or maybe they watch BNN or they watch the news. And yeah. it's like... What they hear, like, oh, I heard this on BNN. I heard this, you know, guy on Market Call talking about such and such. Yeah. And then they they get very focused in on that, like it's uh, the gospel. Gospel. Oh, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Um, that was one of my biggest challenges working with clients is they'd watch a BNN or whatever the source was, and that was that was the truth right then and there without any context. Right. Speaking of older people, you got a call coming in. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that's a good point. Yeah. That I lived and saw. Yeah. And I, I, what I'm trying to get by that is for young people, you could argue there's, there's too many, um, 
there's too much sources we have to learn about these different things. <laughs> right. Old people, not enough. Not enough sources. Limited. And, and, and when they do find those limited sources, they they go down those rabbit holes there. Yeah. Like, I guess it could go either way. But you, yeah, yeah, you're not going to find an older person on, on, on Reddit or on, on Twitter for that matter. Not many. Not, yeah. not as many. Yeah. Um, good, good point. I know that over, you know, in the past, we've talked about that kind of issue because you've tried to sort of educate me and say, Dad, like open those sources up more mm -hmm. than, than you normally use. And there's definitely value to that again. So I think... This whole t topic, Brandon, has been about balance. Yeah. Really, when you think about it. I so, think so, everything that you've said, everything I think are valid points. But if you take them to either extreme, then okay, it, it, it loses the validity. But yeah. Um, so, this is a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is, you know, to maybe wrap up the discussion because we've been going for a while and the camera's going to die. But um, yeah, I think it is, it is balance. Like, I think each, you know, demographic has their flaws. Um, younger people, like, like you said, I think older people have their flaws as well. I definitely think younger people are more susceptible to, yeah, it's tough to say, but nevertheless, it's, it, there's learnings from like both sides. And, and I think it does come down to balance at the end of the day. You never learn, you never stop learning even in this industry. And heck, you talked about, uh, I think you talked about Warren Buffett earlier and yeah. he's 93, whatever it is now. Yeah. And so he didn't start investing. Like he didn't buy Berkshire until I think he was in his forties or somewhere in that range. So not a young pop mm -hmm. when he, when he bought it. And up until fairly recently, the big scheme of things, he said, I'm not going to go into tech. You mm -hmm. know, it's just not my, no, not my game. So if he can learn or him and you know, I always give a lot of credit to Charlie Munger because he's that quiet guy behind the scenes, but he's instrumental in the success uh, of the company. So yeah, I think, I think Brandon, I think we have a consensus between intergenerational. Mm -hmm. We think differently, but we both agree that we can learn from each other. Is that fair to say? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> you can learn from the older generation too. <laughs> yeah. So good.